every knee will bow and every tongue will confess whether they confess him as Lord or in the end they will confess it one way and another every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and Lord we thank you that you are our God you are our Lord you are Lord of all King of kings there is no other name, the name Jesus, Yeshua. No other name in which man can be saved. A name that every demon will tremble. A name that saves lives and souls. A name that says it's all right as we look to the cross. We thank you. We love you. Receive our worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Safely greet one another in the name of the Lord. Good morning. I tell you, worship is awesome. And uh, you guys uh, are part of the worship team. I don't know if you know that, but when you hear voices singing, that's the ultimate instrument right there, and it's done with the heart. So I could tell you as a worship leader for many years um, that that is one of the greatest things I think a worship leader can hear is that people are following along and singing. It's not just us. We're not here to entertain you. <laughs> you know, uh, we're here to lead you into the throne room of God. Just a few announcements uh, before we begin our study. Tuesday, August the 4th, that's this Tuesday, we're going to have our monthly prayer meeting, and I encourage you to come out. Um, if there's ever there's a time that we need to pray, it is now. And I know we put it off, we put it off, we put it off, but I tell you, um, it's important. It's the only way we can communicate with the Lord and He can communicate with us. Um, you can join us. When, you, when we come to the prayer meeting, nothing crazy or wacky takes place here, just in case, if you haven't been part of our worship team, I mean part of our prayer night. Um, uh, we just pray. We have a list of things to pray for. Uh, if you would like to be added to that prayer list for this Tuesday, please fill out the prayer request card. If it's confidential, hit the confidential box in the bottom. Um, and just give us, you don't have to give us the full detail. Pray for my cousin so-and-so. He needs salvation. Or pray for my uh, friend, my neighbor, my coworker who needs uh, healing. And that we can do. We can lift their names up. But we do that together collectively uh, as, as one body. Jesus said, my house should be called a house of prayer. And it's important. Not a house of, you know, entertainment <laughs> or anything else. Programs and ministries is a house of prayer. And if you come, you can come quietly. You can sit in the back. You, you don't have, no, no one's going to put a mic to your, to your give, you, give your mic and have you start praying loudly. You could just be quiet in the back. And just being agreeing with us, just being here uh, makes it uh, all the more powerful and effective. But um, we invite you to come. That's this Tuesday, August 4th from 7 to 8. Then we have uh, the men's. We're going to have a men's gathering. Um, that'll be Saturday, August 29th. I don't know if you noticed the picture. I kind of put Bibles in their hands so that way. <laughs> <laughs> I like that picture. But I put Bibles in their hand. Uh, so that way we know that no matter what we go through in this world, no matter how, you know, <laughs> Frightening it might be, we need the word of God. And so we're going to gather together. We're not too sure whether or not we're going to have any food here because I, I know that's what usually brings the guys out, right? You bring them out, you know, men's breakfast, they're all here. Um, but uh, we're praying about that. We're going to see how that's going to work out. But all, Saturday, August 29th, a marketing account at 9 a.m. And then with that said, we also have the women's ministry, and that will be next uh, following month, Saturday, September 19th from 10 to 11 a M. And so we'll keep you posted on that. And that's it in a way of announcement. Let us turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24. If you need a Bible, please raise your hand. We would like for you to follow along with us as we study God's Word verse by verse. So good to know that everyone has their Bibles. Great. Let us go before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we're able to assemble in this country, America, where many 
of our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ around the world don't have that privilege. But Lord, here we are, and we thank you. We we're so blessed that we can meet. Your word said, do not forsake the gathering of the saints. So here we are, Lord, and we only, we're here for only one reason, because of you, to glorify you, to worship you, and to hear from you. And so that's what we want to do now, Lord. We ask that you would be our teacher this morning. And Lord, as we study your word, open up our eyes that we may see, our ears that we may hear, our mind that we may understand, and our hearts ready to receive what your word has for us this morning. We bless your name. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 through 8. We're going to read verses 1 through 8. Matthew writes, Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Or surely I say to you, Not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. Matthew chapter 24, we're beginning what is called the Olivet Discourse. And the Olivet Discourse begins with chapter 24 verse 1 all the way to chapter 25 and it's called the Olivet Discourse because this is um, where Jesus gave this discourse this it speaks primarily about uh, the great tribulation period the Lord's second coming and so it's entirely prophetic so chapters 24 and 25 are prophetic now the Olivet Discourse is primarily, but not exclusively, primarily for the nation of Israel. It concerns the nation of Israel. And so we're going to see that unfold as we make our way verse by verse from chapter 24 all the way to chapter 25. Now, in our last study, Jesus gave the Pharisees and the scribes eight woes describing their characteristics of who they are as leaders and he gave them gave them these stern warnings which is, was his last public sermon his last public sermon he gave eight woes compared to his first public sermon which was the beatitudes and now from here on he will be uh, just speaking with his disciples because soon as a matter of days jesus will be on the cross at calvary we also ended when Jesus lamented over Jerusalem in verses 37 and 35, where Jesus said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stoned those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gather her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Now, this is important. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more. Till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So that brings us to the Olivet Discourse. Now, we're going to look at verses 1 through 8. We're going to just take this bit by bit. And in verses 1 to 2, we're going to see that Jesus speaks of the destruction of the temple. The destruction of the temple in verses 1 and 2. And in verses 3 to 8, the disciples are going to ask Jesus, Two questions, and Jesus will give them an answer. So let us look at our study this morning, verse by verse. Matthew chapter 24, verse 1. It says, Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple. After giving the eight walls to the scribes and the Pharisees, Jesus now leaves the temple mount area. It is still Tuesday. It's a long day. And soon he's going to be put to the cross. But on, on the way Jesus leaves the temple mount area... 
after turning over the tables, after rebuking the Pharisees and the scribes, I like that too. <laughs> Jesus, uh, on his way, he was making his way to Bethany, but he made his way to Bethany by way of going to the Mount of Olives, the Mount of Olives, and this is what the next two chapters are going to take place. So it says, then Jesus went out and departed from there, and his disciples came up to him to show him the buildings of the temple. And so as Jesus and disciples, they leave the Temple Mount area, they make their way into the Mount of Olives, and the Mount of Olives is a real little uh, hill. You can actually see the, the, the entire uh, Temple Mount along with the temple. And I just want to show you a picture of how it looked in those days. It's a nice little painting. And you can see, uh, that's pretty much how you can see uh, uh, all, you know, the temple today in Israel. But this is just to give you a picture. Because I want you to have this mindset. I want to take you back to this time. The picture, if you will, as Jesus and his disciples are talking about this temple. It's going to, we're going to just park here a little bit uh, regarding the temple. Now, this is how it looks today. If you go to Israel, they take you to the Mount of Olives. You can, the next picture. The next picture you can see, that's how it looks today. Right there you see the Dome of the Rock. Um, and, but right there you could also see, uh, can you push, put it back one, just put it back one. You see right there, that's the Eastern Gate. And that's where that gate actually lines up to uh, the temple. They thought that they built the Dome of the Rock just to go against the Jews, but they kind of miscalculated. Good thing, because um, the, the, the fourth temple, some people say the third, and we're going to get to that, will be built during the Great Tribulation. And that gate there, the Eastern Gate, is where it leads up to the temple. The grave site that you see in front of the Eastern Gate, uh, Muslims, it's a Muslim territory. They purposely uh, buried their dead there to say, well, if your Messiah is coming, we're going to stop them. So that's why they have a Muslim. But uh, they're not going to stop them. They're dead. Anyway, so <laughs> now, now in the parallel gospel, in Mark chapter 13, and you also will find this in Luke chapter 21. In Mark's gospel, it tells us that it was one of his disciples. We read it in Matthew's gospel. He says his disciples came to Jesus. Mark tells us it's one of the disciples. And then in Luke, it tells us that this one disciple, we don't know who, um, spoke uh, and pointed out this beautiful temple to Jesus as, as if Jesus never saw it. But I think they wanted Jesus to chime in and say, yes, what a beautiful temple. Uh, they're going to be surprised at Jesus' answer. And so they adorn the beautiful stones and the decoration and all its gold. But this here is referring to Herod's temple built by Herod the Great. This here, many say, is the second temple, or some people, you know, I say is the third temple, and we're going to prove that to you in a little bit. But it was the third temple, um, and people say, well, the third temple, I heard the third temple we built during the Great Tribulation, but uh, we're going to look at scripture, and we're going to look at history to prove that the Herodian temple, the temple which Jesus is referring to is the third temple there will be a fourth temple, another temple that will be built during the Great Tribulation. By the way, for those of you who came with us and a trip to Israel, the last time we went through what's called the Temple Mount Institute, they have everything ready. They have all the stones, they have the garments, they have the furnishings, they have everything that is needed to have a temple and worship service. It's just a matter of what leader is going to allow that to take place. So now, let me give you a history of these the temples. The first temple was Solomon Temple, uh, was built by King Solomon, the son of King David, back in 965 B.C. And you can find that for you students who are taking notes, 2 Chronicles chapter 3, that's where it begins, and it ends in 1 Kings chapter 8, uh, where uh, Solomon gives this incredible uh, uh, dedication and prayer. And so the first temple, Solomon's temple, it actually replaced the portable tabernacle, the, the little tent that uh, Moses would, would uh, carry and the, the, the children of Israel would worship, the, the tent that the Lord it gave him instruction how to build this tabernacle. And this was the tent that was a portable tent. It was, you know, they would break it down. They would build it back up while they were in the wilderness. And so that was the first temple. 
However, it was destroyed in 400, 400 years later in 586 B.C. So it was built in 965 B.C., was destroyed in 586 B.C. That was the first temple, Solomon's temple. The second temple, and this is important because this is where people actually skip over this particular temple. It was built by Zerubbabel and, and, and in 516 B.C., and in Haggai chapter 1 and 2, you find that story where Zerubbabel built the second temple. Now, here's the reason why people say second. Third is because many of the Jews would skip over this particular temple. And, and there, there are reasons why. Because they did not consider this temple that was built by Zerubbabel in, in Haggai chapter 1 and 2. Because it, it did not compare to the temple that Solomon built. It was built with it all splendor. It was amazing. And there were three things that uh, this temple did not have. Number one, uh, the first temple, Solomon's temple, the Lord lit the altar with fire from heaven. Secondly, the Shekinah glory was in the temple of Solomon, not with this temple. And thirdly, which is more importantly, the Ark of the Covenant was not in Zerubbabel's temple. It was in Solomon's temple because at this time, Israel did not have possession of the Ark. And the Ark was the symbol of God. It was in the Holy of Holies, if you remember for you students. Nonetheless... With all that, God was still pleased. He was pleased with Zerubbabel. At the end of the book of Haggai, the Lord said to him in Haggai chapter 2. Some people say Haggai, Haggai, so you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, in chapter 2 and verses 23, verse 23, it says, the Lord says this. In that day, the Lord of hosts said, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Sheatiel, said the, says the Lord. And will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, said the Lord of hosts. So this is the second temple. At, you have history, and you have scripture to back that up. Now the third temple. The third temple is the temple we're looking at this morning in our text in Matthew 24. And this is the temple in which the disciples were trying to uh, show Jesus that they were admiring the temple. It was built by King Herod. King Herod was an incredible builder. He built the Caesarea of Maritime. If you go to Israel, it's a big seaport, and it's, a, it's amazing the things he built. He built Masada. For those of you who went with us to Israel, we went to Masada. And it's amazing. They, he built a city uh, out of a mountain, a rock and stone. It's incredible. Just Google the images. You'll be impressed with what, how he built that in those days. Now, King Herod built the temple. He began building it in 19 B.C. and continued construction until 64 A.D. Some people, some scholars say that he didn't finish building it. He just kept, continued to add to it. It was something about the Temple Mount and its building, its surroundings, that uh, really uh, gave uh, King, uh, I mean, Herod the Great much time to put in and energy. But we find with the historian, the Jewish historian by the name of Josephus, Josephus says that Herod's temple, uh, um, he writes about it in the, his, his writings of the Jewish war and antiquity of the Jews. And according to Josephus, the temple stood on top of a mount, as you see in Israel. And he had extended the temple mount, made it much wider. And he built these massive retaining walls to hold up the south side and the west side of the temple mount. And when you go to Israel, you'll see the corner of that uh, temple mount. Some of those stones are actually 12 feet high, 45 feet wide, 12 feet deep. They each weighed about 100, uh, 100 tons. They were quarantined somewhere else. They were shaped and cut perfectly that they didn't need mortar to, to put them together. You couldn't even put a blade once they put these stones together. And you can actually see this. I have a picture if you go into Israel, these are, these are one of the stones that if you go to the rabbinical tunnel, when you go to the Temple Mount, there is a way that you go down almost 45 to 50 feet below. 
and it's a very narrow a tunnel. If you see to the side, there's not really much room. Only maybe two people the most could fit through it. And so when, if you're there as a, a, as a tourist, you, with everyone, they have to wait till everyone goes right through. If it's 100 people, you have to wait for all 100. But this is on the foundation of the Temple Mount, um, and we find that in the writings of Josephus. So we can see how heavy these stones were, how massive they were. Now, Mark, in his gospel, he quotes what the disciples said to Jesus in Mark chapter 13, verse 1. He says, teacher, speaking to Jesus, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. Because he's referring to these massive stones. Also referring to all of the, the temple itself, it was completely white marble and gold. The temple itself, not the temple mount, the temple itself. And in verse 1 of chapter 24, we see that the disciples are showing Jesus the buildings, plural, because he's referring to the entire temple mount. And let's look at that slide. I have a slide here of Herod's temple on the temple mount. And you can see right dead center is the temple. Around it, you find the, um, uh, the chambers. And uh, they have the chamber of oil, the chamber of wood, those four uh, corners within the center. Uh, you can hit the next slide. You see those four corners before leading into the temple? Uh, the, these, are, you have, these are chambers, chambers for wood, for leopards. Leopards couldn't, if they needed to worship. They were Jews only. Jews only were allowed in this area. If there were Gentiles in this area, they would be stoned to death. And there is a sign there. So the outer courts, the very edge there were the court of the Gentiles. This is where Jesus actually turned the tables because this is where the Gentiles should be at least encouraged to worship God, but they used the area of the Gentiles to sell, and they were robbing them hand and fist. So these four chambers, uh, the other one is the Nazarite chamber. Then you have Solomon, uh, Solomon's, the, the uh, portico uh, around, and also the royal portico uh, that leads around uh, the, uh, the, you see, um, around the temple itself, which is the second half on the upper left-hand side. So that is what you see. Also, Josephus tells us that the doors to the actual temple were 49 feet high by 24, all layered with gold. All layered with, now, I have to tell you this just so you can see how beautiful, how massive this, structure, this, this whole structure was. But it was so beautiful that in the T Babylonian Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud, uh, they have said this. They said, he that never saw the temple of Herod never saw a finer building. And in those days, that was true. That was the most spectacular structure in all of history around the world in that time. So throughout history, the Jews had these three temples, and, and the children of Israel is where the children of Israel would meet, and they would worship God. It was the center of their, uh, of their lives. It was the center of everything. Now, back to Matthew 24, we see the disciples, as they look and they admire the building, how beautiful it is, the temple mount, and they see the sun. The sun at certain times could reflect off the doors of the gold, the golden doors of the temple, and it would reflect, it would shine. And they're looking at this at, at, at the Mount of Olives, and they're saying, Jesus, isn't that beautiful? Isn't it beautiful, Jesus? The stones, the gold. But verse 2, verse 2, back to Matthew chapter 24, verse 2, Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? In other words, you see all the beautiful buildings, the structure, the marble, the gold, the decoration. Do you see all these things? Or surely I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. I could imagine the face of the disciples. Oy vey, Jesus, how can you say that? The temple. Oh, Jesus, take that back. I'm, I'm surprised Peter didn't say something. He's always got his foot in his mouth, right? The only time he takes his foot out of mouth is to put the other foot in. But he's always saying something. But you can imagine their faces. Oh, Jesus. But how can that be? How would God allow our temple to be destroyed? You see, to the Jews, the temple was everything. The temple was, meant everything to them as a people, as a nation. 
The temple is where God dwelled, where God was worshipped. The temple was everything that was sacred and holy to them. And to think that the temple will be destroyed, they were blown away, every single one. And now they all gathered. Sadly, Jesus' prediction came true 40 years later. 40 years later, 70 AD, the the Romans took over the capital city of Jerusalem and they destroyed the Herodian temple, the third temple. And that all began back in 66 AD, uh, Titus, the uh, Roman general who later became uh, the emperor of Rome, he came into Jerusalem with some scholars and historians say three of his legions, some say four, the tenth, the fifth legion, those that believe in the three legions, they say the fifth legion, the twelfth, and the fifteenth. Some say four, which I personally believe is neither here nor there, but the tenth legion is made up of a certain group of people. Now, the way it worked with the Roman legions, it, the, the, it would comprise of, of, of people that they were, were drawn from surrounding countries, different people groups. You know, it's like if America, we have a military. It, how many different cultures are in our country that are wearing the uniform fighting for our country? That's how it was with Rome. And it's believed that the 10th legion was the one responsible for the torching of this temple. Because the 10th legion, many of them are the people who are from Islamic countries today. So you can connect the dots. But that's neither here nor there. Uh, there was an uprising, a Jewish revolt because of the anti-taxation, a, pro, a, a protest that took place. Uh, Jews and Roman citizens were attacking each other to the point where now Rome comes in with his army. And according to Josephus, who was the a witness to this event, 1,100,000 people were killed during this time. Mostly all were Jews. 97,000 were taken and enslaved while the others scattered uh, out to away out of uh, Israel. Now, Josephus tells us that Titus gave an order not to destroy the temple. But according to Josephus, he said that one of the soldiers took an arrow, a torch, and lit up the, uh, the, the uh, temple, and it, it caught a blaze. And here is where Jesus' prophecy is being fulfilled and is being specific. Because once it lit up into flames, all the gold that was in the temple melt and melted and went made its way into the cracks so this is in order for them to get to the goal what they have to do take off the stones you see so this w took place exactly now i have some um pictures if you go to israel you see some of the stones some of the uh, the archaeologists have left a lot of these stones that were at the top of the temple mount and you can see the damage on your lower right hand side the impact of those stones making uh, its way to the ground and you get a damage it could, is done uh, you see on that same picture on your lower right hand uh, those were shops those were stores those little um, uh, little entryways that you see there but you can see these stones they're they're big they're massive and the reason why they topped over these stones was to get to the gold. And this is why Jesus said, not one stone would be left upon the other. That prophecy was fulfilled 40 years after Jesus mentioned this to his disciples. Now, after doing my study here, I find it interesting. I find it interesting that just this past Thursday, Thursday, July 30th, Jews from around the world, they celebrate a holiday, and that really much they commemorate this holiday, and it's the saddest holiday of all. And it is uh, the holiday called Tisha B'Av. Tisha B'Av. Now, this is a holiday. They just finished a comm commemorating, and it's a sad day. Why? Because on their Jewish calendar, the 9th of Av, falls in an Al Gargarian calendar. The end of July, first week of August. We're in that time. 
They're commemorating this day. And what they're commemorating? The destruction of the temple. They, just this week, are commemorating the, the destruction of the temple. Now, here's it was interesting. They're not only commemorating the first temple, Solomon, but also the third temple. Because the first, Solomon's temple, and the temple here that Jesus is referring to, were destroyed on the very exact same day on their Jewish calendar, the ninth of Av. Who would have thought? And I find that fascinating. And again, we studied this last week. Remember when Jesus, after he rebuked the Pharisees in Matthew 23, verse 38, Jesus says, see, your house has left you desolate. Now, that could apply for all of Israel and also could apply to the Pharisees. And I think it has, it, it refers to both. Because again, we as Christians, this is a building. This is not the church. You are the church, and we know that. I, I, I appreciate what Pastor Ed uh, Sepanowski uh, said uh, last Sunday. He said, the church was never closed because the church was still there. The church was in the homes, worshiping God, whether it's through Zoom, whatever it is. The church is never was closed because the church is, is the people. We are the church. And, and that's what's important. Now, back to Matthew 24, verse 3. Now, they're blown away. Uh, this was too heavy for them. Jesus gives this, this prediction of their temple. Everything that defines who they are was a temple. As a matter of fact, in the ancient world, if they didn't have a temple, almost every city that was taken over by Rome, they, every, every city and every town, in order for it to be recognized, it had to have its own temple. Just like every city, the city hall. It, 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 a city without a, a town hall it really meant nothing. To them, it was the temple. And so the disciples, you got to understand their mindset. I, I'm, you know, I'm giving you a lot here before we do it. You know, pretty much we, we probably cover about maybe about 10 verses by now. But I want to give you the picture of what's going to take place. It's all going to lead up. It's all going to make sense as we study the Olivet Discourse. And we're going to take it little by little. But I want you to understand their mindset. Because the disciples, like all of the Jews, they believe that when the Messiah come, that they will be, re they will be set free from the, the bondage of Rome. And they can now have their own state, their own king, their own, their own land. And the disciples... They asked this question, okay, if the temple is being destroyed, I thought the Messiah was going to come. I thought he was going to save us. I thought he was going to rule and reign here on earth. Yes, but not like the way the world would want a king and ruling and reigning. Jesus' kingdom is a kingdom of righteousness. It's a heavenly kingdom. The kingdom of God, we've studied this in the gospel. The kingdom of God, where is the kingdom of God? It's very simple. Wherever God is. The kingdom of God is in our heart. The kingdom of God is in our dwelling place when we worship here. The kingdom of God is in heaven. So they're thinking of a, of a worldly kingdom. So they're thinking, how can the Messiah come if the temple is going to be destroyed? So now they're thinking end times. This is now their question that's going to lead uh, two questions that ask, actually, it's going to be the longest answer you'll ever find in the New Testament. There is no answer longer than the answer Jesus is going to give regarding the end times that we find here because it's two chapters long. Matthew chapter 24 and Matthew chapter 25. All of it is answer about the end times and now they're curious about the end times. I think every person, even till today, People are worrying about the end times. You, you find it on TV, doomsday preppers, you know, and people who don't believe in the Lord and believe in Christ's coming return, and they're thinking there has to be an end. Look what's happening now. How many meteors and meteor has to pass earth before, you know, we count up, continue to count our blessings? Think about it. And so this gives us the end time, eschatology. And Jesus is going to give them the answer. So here are the questions that they ask. Let's look at verse 3. Verse 3. It says, Now he, Jesus, sat on the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, 
when will these things be? The first question, when will these things be? In other words, Jesus, they're referring to the temple. When will the temple be destroyed? That's their first question. The second question is two parts. And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of age? Now, in the parallel gospel, we'll find that it was only four of the 12 disciples that went to Jesus to ask these questions. You find that in Mark chapter 13, verses 3 and 4. It says, now as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite of the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign? And when are these things will be fulfilled? And so... Jesus is going to give them their two-chapter-long answer. They want to know. Now, Jesus is going to answer their first question last. And he's going to answer their second question first. Okay, I don't want to confuse you. Right? <laughs> the first question, he's going to answer last. The second question, he's going to answer first. And so the, so the second question what will be the sign of your coming and the end of age? Now, the word age in the Greek is ion, ion, and is mentioned 41 times in the New Testament, and it refers to the end of time, the end of an era, or the end of a world. Okay, people think the end of a planet. Uh, no, there's much work to be done. And the great tribulation is needed. Well, even though by the time when you read chapter 6 and 19 of the book of Revelation, you're going to find that, hey, uh, everything in, on this earth and planet is going to be shift. It's going to be moved. Your maps and your GPS are going to not match up with the world by the time uh, the great tribulation is done. Now, to the disciples, they believe that the Messiah will come and bring an end to the current age, their time. They're thinking that their time, the end, when the Messiah comes, that will be the end time, the time that they were living in. That's what they're thinking. To bring an end to the righteousness and a new age, a new age of righteousness. In other words, they believe that the second coming of the Messiah will happen immediately. They're thinking, okay, you're here, Jesus. You're the Messiah, we believe. You remember when he asked Jesus, when Jesus asked the disciple, who do men say who I am? Who do you say I am? Jesus, you're the Christ, meaning the Messiah, the anointed one. We already know you're the Messiah. So when will these things be? The temple is going to be destroyed, but I thought that you would be ruling and reigning and, and, and saving us from Rome. See, the problem is the disciples... At that time, the disciples at that time, before the birth of the church, before they started writing some of the epistles, at that time, you see, they didn't have the totality of scriptures as we do. We have all the scriptures. For example, the, the disciples, like the, the, the disciple John, who wrote the book of Revelation, John. Christ had yet revealed the book of Revelation to John. And what about Peter? And Peter's second epistle, when he starts writing the, about the final stages of the day of the Lord, cleansing the earth with fire, it's going to rain fire. In Genesis, the Lord judged the world with a flood. In the end, it's going to, he's going to judge the world with fire. What about the Apostle Paul and his writing, all the eschatology passages that we find? Paul has yet to be saved at this time. Paul is still Saul of Tarsus. He's still a Pharisee. And he has not written uh, Thessalonians chapter, uh, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians. But also, before the end of age, for you students and for us, we need to understand this. There's a few things that need to take place. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Remember the day of Pentecost when they were in the upper room, the outpouring of the Spirit. That needed to take place. And that was going to take place when? In the last days. In the last days, Joel chapter 2, the prophecy, that was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. The last day I will pour out my spirit upon all, upon all flesh. Also, the fulfillment of the Gentiles, that has to take place before the end of the age. Also, the rapture of the church needs to take place. Now, I know there's a pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, and the pan-trib. You know, pre-trib, people believe, hey, that... You know, that's what we believe. I believe we're not, sub we're not appointed to wrath. 
There are many passages in Scripture that you'll find that we are a pre-trib church. The reason is there are many, many passages to prove that. The word church is mentioned 19 times in chapter 1, 2, and 3 of the book of Revelation. It's not mentioned anymore. Why? Because the church is no longer the church. It's raptured. It is the bride. During the tribulation here, seven years, seven years is going to be a ceremony, a honeymoon, and then we're going to return back with Christ. But what did, which is important that people forget, the same God is in the, the same God in the New Testament, the same God in the Old Testament. In Genesis, when, when the Lord said, I'm going to bring, I'm going to judge Sodom and Gomorrah. And then Abraham said, but it's not like you. Uh, you. Who are you to judge the righteous, the church, with the wicked? God doesn't judge the righteous with the wicked. As a matter of fact, the angel said to Lot, we can't do anything until you're out of here. And what did the angels do? They grabbed them physically. God cannot bring judgment. If you were the bride, why would he bring judgment to hurt the bride? So, there's so many. God saved Noah from judgment, right? He judged the world, but he saved Noah. Uh, during the plagues of, of, of Egypt, God saved Israel. They were with Egypt. You see, we're not appointed to wrath, so the rapture needs to take place. And then the seven-year, great that'll bring in the seven-year of, of, of the great tribulation. So after the great tribulation, the end of the age, we see the second coming. Jesus would then rule and reign for a thousand years, spoken of in Revelation chapter 20. Rule and reign for a thousand years. And many people don't believe that. They believe that's happening now. Well, well, I, I don't see that. And so Jesus answers the what question. And to help us understand, we're going to get there. I promise you we're going to finish this chapter. Just drop down to verse 8. Look at verse 8. What does it say? All these things are the beginning of sorrows. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. Some of your translations, you may have uh, the beginning of birth pains or labor pains because that's the, uh, that's the right translation. And so the authorized version, the King James Version, the New King James Version, they have um, the beginning of sorrows, but the actual Greek word is referring to birth pain. So it's a metaphor that you find throughout scriptures in Isaiah as well. And throughout the scripture is a reference to suffering and judgment. Suffering and judgment. And so as a woman is pregnant and is about to have, and the birth pains become a closer and closer and more severe, it's only the beginning. And boy, are we witnessing those birth pains now. It's only the beginning. Because we are in the last days. When did the last days begin? The last days began, Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, read it. In Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost, when the birth of the church and that's when, in Acts chapter 2, Peter quoted the prophet Joel. He said, in the last, as a matter of fact, I have the verse here, Acts chapter 2, verse 19. Let's look at that. This is what he said. He's quoting from Joel chapter 2. This is what he said. And it shall come to pass in the what? Last day, says the Lord, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dreams, dreams. So the last day, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and that's continuing on today. Did it stop then? No, it did not, because the Holy Spirit is still working in the church today. We are still in the last days. Now, we think the way it's phrased last days, we just think it's a matter of a day or a week or a month. No, the last days began at the day of Pentecost. And so understand that term, last day, the, which is also called the church age, right? The church was birthed at the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The last days, the church is growing. Almost 2,000 years ago, the church is still thriving. Even with the coronavirus. You know, I just saw in the news that there were literally, literally thousands and thousands of people in the beach of California getting baptized. It's a revival going on. And God is still moving. 
because God is building the church. We're in the church age, the last days, the church age. God is building a church. When the, it's ready, he's going to come, he's, and he's going to come. Believe you me. And it will continue on until when? Birth of the church, rapture. That's the last days. So when people say last days, they think, oh, no, we're getting, no. Yeah, we're getting close <laughs> to the very last, last day, but the last days referring to that time. Now, here's Jesus' answer, verse 4. Let's look at verse 4. And Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Remember, all these things, right? What does it say in verse 8? All these things are the beginning of sorrow. What's the first thing Jesus tells us? That in the last day, take heed that nobody deceives you. Nobody deceives you, for the many will come in my name. The deception began even with the early church. When we read the epistle of John, when we read the epistle of John, I'm going to read it to you because during the time of John, it's not up there, during the time of John, the disciple, I'm not talking about the gospel of John, but his epistle to the early church. During that time, there was a teaching in the early church. And we're talking about second generation Christians and third generation Christians running around during this time. But this is what, what, what John had to write because the Gnostics were coming in. Gnosticism was a teaching. They were saying that Jesus wasn't a real man. They were saying that Jesus was a phantom. They were saying so much that, that Jesus, when he would walk, he wouldn't leave, leave footprints in the sand. This began in the early church. So why do you think John had to write this? This is what he writes. He said, in verse 1 of chapter 1, it says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard which we we seen with our eyes and looked upon meaning we gazed upon him upon and and, and our hands that handled him we touched him he wasn't a phantom he was real concerning the word of life speaking of jesus the life which manifested and he and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you the eternal life which was with the father and was manifested to us John had to write this to the early church because already at that first time, the first generation Christians were experiencing deception. There were a lot of false teachers. So what do you think about now? <laughs> Even more so now. Church, church has become an entertainment place. They're not, they're not really teaching or feeding you the word of God. They're tickling your ears with, with different sermon and topicals. Some of those things are great, but you leave empty-handed. It's like cotton candy. It tastes great in your mouth, but it does nothing for you and evaporates as soon as it goes in your mouth. It's nothing. Well, have you learned the scriptures that when we leave today, I know when you read verses 1 through 9 of Matthew 24, you're going to understand it. It's important. The church has been deceived from the very beginning. Many have fallen away. This is what Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. He says, the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, meaning the last days, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirit and doctrines of demons. There is a church, believe it or not, the Bethel Church. Yeah, we love their music, great worship. But you know, they do, they do grave soul sucking. You know what they do? You know what their practice is? This is Bethel Church. You go to a grave of one of the most incredible preachers, and you go over their brains, and hopefully that the spirit of this dead carcass that's already in the presence of the Lord, that they would have the anointing. That's a practice, people. And people are falling into it. Google it. It's there. Google it. Bethel Church, grave soaking, suck, whatever it is. They go to the grave like Finney, one of the great preachers, and they figure if they touch his tomb that they will get filled. They will have the same power and anointing he had in his ministry. That's demonic. But because someone preaches it from the pulpit, it's okay. And that's the problem. 
2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13, it says, for such, are, for such are false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into an apostle of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Who do you think spoke to uh, Joseph Smith? Anybody know who Joseph Smith is? He started the Mormon movement. 15-year-old boy goes into the woods, and all of a sudden, a 15-year-old go boy goes in the woods, come back out. I wouldn't listen to him. I don't know why he became, started a religion. 15, 15 years old, he goes to the, to the woods, and God appeared to him and said, you know, because he was wondering what religion to join, the Baptists, the Pentecostals, or whatever. And he said, join either one of them. And they're floating on air, and he's in the woods, and he comes out with, a, with another gospel. And now we have the Mormon movement today. It says here, angel can transform himself as an angel of light. So don't be deceived. Today, there are over 4,000 religious groups in the world today. The Hindus, they believe that Jesus is an avatar of God. The Muslims believe that Jesus was just a man and a prophet. The Mormons believe that Jesus is the spirit brother of Lucifer. The Jehovah Witness believe that Jesus is the, uh, the Michael, the archangel. That's another Jesus. One of the common denominators in all kinds of false teaching is when they preach another Jesus, another gospel. When they, when they start messing with the deity of Christ, be careful. And why are people being deceived? Why? Very simple. They do not read their Bibles. They do not read their Bibles, and they don't test all things. And this is what John tells us. First John chapter 4, verse 1. John tells us this. Beloved, he's talking to you. Do not believe every spirit. That's the first thing. No matter how spiritual it looks, how spiritual it sounds, no matter how close to Christian it's, it, it looks like, first don't believe it. It's okay. It's okay if you were wrong. Oh, it is of God. But he says first, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So number one, in the last days, before the great tribulation, before the end of it, there's going to be many who are deceived. Now let's look at verse 6. He says, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. In other words, don't panic. You hear wars, you're always going to hear war, wars. Why? Why shouldn't you panic? Look at the rest of verse 6. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is what? Not yet. Every single war from the first world after the death of our Lord and Savior, you could probably look at the, all of them throughout history, you know, even until now. Many were, were, were troubled. Many feared. I can imagine during the time of World War I and World War II, even when we went to the Gulf War, okay, oh, signs of rumor, Jesus coming soon. Yeah, there were wars back then. The last days began at the day of Pentecost. So every war from that time up to now, Jesus says, don't trouble yourself. You can't judge it by a war. And stop judging it by a war. These things must happen. All these things must take place. There are going to be many more wars and rumors of wars. Every time King Young Moon from whatever, whatever his name is uh, from... North Korea starts getting itchy, whatever, and now he disappeared. Nobody knows who he is. It, it, the whole place has been a, a mystery itself. And a little guy like him, chubby little guy, is going to put fear in the country, you know? And, and we got to all think about it. We're not to be troubled. Jesus said, you're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars, but do not let that trouble you. You don't judge it by that. You don't judge it by that. 2 Thessalonians, verse one, verse, um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7, it says, And to give to you who are troubled, believers, he's talking to the church of Thessalonica, rest with us. Be, we have a rest in Jesus. It says, When the Lord Jesus revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Don't worry about what's going on. Don't worry about it. God is in control. Rest with, don't let... Don't let your spirit be troubled. This should be exciting times, as a matter of fact. I look at all this and, man, this is awesome. I look at the news more problems. Sad, 
but this is awesome. Jesus is coming. He's coming. Verse 7, he says, for nation will rise against nation. Now, the word nation in the Greek is ethnos, which we get the word ethnic. And so it's talking about a people group, a, a, a tribe. Not necessarily talking about a nation as a country. We're going to see that next. But it's referring to the same people group of the same country, the same reason, rising up against each other. Don't we see that in history? Don't we see that today as we turn on? We all fight with each other in the same country because our political views, whether or not to wear a mask or, or you know, the weirdest things, or the color of our skin or, or how we dress, how we look. And it's, and it's sad. And it's sad. Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all in Christ. And the church should be the first one to stand up for truth. Not, not kneel down for the most weirdest things and all these organizations that really people have no idea if they do a research on the computer. And it's sad. I just was blessed this week by hearing one basketball star by the name, I think, is Isaac Johnson, of the Magic, Orlando Magic, didn't kneel down. Now, I'm not, I'm not into the pol political stuff. But the reason why he stood up is because he was a believer in Jesus Christ. And he believed that all lives matter and all lives need Jesus. That's what he said. And he stood up. The only one. But yet, he has people in his own country and probably his own neighborhood, his own family that will rise up against him. So it will be nation against nation. Jesus goes on to say, and kingdom against kingdom. The word kingdom is, in the Greek is bel, uh, basilia. And it, it, it speaks of a nation but with a ruler. So it's a nation with a, a king. And it can refer to a nation like ethnos. But Jesus used the word kingdom, basilia. And what I believe strongly is not so much kingdom against kingdom in a sense of nations and country against country. But I believe, because he already made it clear uh, how serious it is, is more serious than country go against country, but a country to battle within itself. We saw that nation against nation. But I think this has a spiritual connotation to it. I believe it's talking about a spiritual battle. Let me explain why. First of all, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, it says, For we, that's you and I, believers in Christ, do not wrestle against flesh and blood. What do we wrestle? But against principalities, against darkness, against the rulers of, dark, of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Another example, Israel. Just look at Israel. At times, it'll help you understand some scripture. How long they've been fighting? Since the book of Exodus, since they were a nation, for fighting for land. Are they still fighting for the land now? Absolutely. They have given up land. Over the years, they've been given up land. Pretty soon, they're going to be left with an anchor. But notice that all the surrounding nations that are against them, there are 10 times, the, each one at 10 times the size of Israel. Israel is small in the state of, uh, small in the state of Jersey. So this battle over land, and just not long ago, they gave up the Gaza. How ugly that was. Do you think it's about land? No, it's demonic. It's demonic. It's, it's a spiritual battle. And the enemy knows it. So nation against nation, kingdom against uh, kingdom. And he says, and there will be famines. So what follows war, usually it's, you have famine. In fact, if you compare Matthew 24 to Revelation chapter 6 with the horsemen, the four horsemen, right? They are parallel. They're not the same. This is not the great tribulation. 
These are things that must take place, right? All these things must uh, are the beginning of sorrows. So some people have, and I, I believe that many years ago, I believe that Matthew 24 was Revelation uh, chapter 6, the first four seals of the seven, the seals of the scroll. Remember the four horsemen. But they are almost parallel to each other. The four horsemen. Now, in Matthew 24, you know, we'll see that uh, there is famine, right? Verse 5, what did Jesus say? He said, first he said, there will be, there were many will come in my name saying I am the Christ. That's the white horse. That's the white horseman. He has a bow no arrow. He has a crown that was given to him. He didn't make himself king. People made him king. He has a bow, but no arrow. Why? <laughs> because he's going to lead the war, but he's not going to make it. That's left up to the red horse. The red horse, it brings war. That's the second seal broken from the seal, the scroll. And, and, and what, did, what, did, what did Jesus say in verse 6? And you will hear wars and rumors of wars, right? That's the horsemen. And then the black horse springs famine, and that's what we're reading now. It's famine. After wars, you have famine. And then you're going to have the pale horse. That'll bring death and haze. Now, as of August this month, 2020, the world population is 7.8 billion. Got it from a website. You may say, oh, Pastor, you're wrong. You're not. Oh, who cares? It's 7.8 billion. That's what I got from the internet, okay? A lot of people... Half of the population lives on only $2 a day. We don't understand that. <laughs> Even if we didn't get a stimulus, okay, we don't know what it's like to be poor. We don't. Our poorest people in our country are multimillionaires compared to the average person in other countries. It is estimated that more than 690 million people will go hungry, unnourished, Every day in the world. Of course, that's going to usher in a pale horse, right? Death and haze. So now, pestilence and earthquakes. The word pestilence here in the Greek is the word loimas. And it speaks, uh, it doesn't necessarily speak about, you know, bugs. And yeah, that could be it and, and, and pests. But it's speaking about plagues and disease. And I think we know all too well. I don't have to give you a whole list of all these plagues and these diseases that are killing people. Not only COVID, but you also have a heart disease. You have, you have cancer. You have all kinds of disease, malaria. People are dying in the hundreds and tens of thousands, even in the millions. As a matter of fact, um, three million, it is estimated 40 million people in the world are affected with AIDS. Three million have died. Okay, now I got some Corona status stats. Don't know if it's true. Okay, <laughs> right? The world death six hundred eighty one thousand as of yesterday, one hundred fifty four thousand here in the United States. But again, verse eight: all these things are the beginning of sorrow. Nothing. Let's put it all, everything that we're just reading now that Jesus is giving in verses 4 to 7, it's just a mild preview of what's really going to take during the great tribulation when the church is gone. It's just a mild preview. It's just, if you read, read for homework. I won't test you next Sunday, but read chapter 6 through 19 and just see what devastation awaits those who reject Jesus Christ before the church is taken up. And then Jesus and earthquakes in various places at the end of verse 9. On the average, uh, 13,600 earthquakes have been recorded since uh, 2010. Um, this year, 7,900 earthquakes um, all mostly uh, uh, 4.9, uh, 5.0, but we see them. There are 12 tectonic plates that covers this earth, 12. And every time there's an earthquake, what do you think they were concerned about? Tsunamis. Because every time the earth quakes and shakes and all moves, everything is shifting and moving. Before you know it, there's going to be a tectonic plate that's just going to 
overlap one other, and that's going to bring a tsunami. I think the world is getting ready. These birth pains are happening. And before anything takes, gives birth, the great tribulation, we'll be out of here. Drop down to verse 21. We'll look at this next week, Lord willing. Verse 21. Jesus says this in Matthew 24, verse 21. For then there will be a great tribulation. Understand, great. Jesus says in this world you have tribulation, right? We're not just talking tribulation because the world can give you tribulation. Bring it, (laughs) right? But no one can give a great tribulation but God himself. He said, for then there will be a great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world, since creation. Until this time, no, nor ever shall be. What's going to take place in the great tribulation in chapter 6 through 19 of Revelation, is this, this world has never experienced anything like it. And when he means nor ever shall be, that means that is it. And if you want to just also read the plagues that God has brought judgment on Pharaoh, all the plagues, all ten of those plagues were the gods that they worshipped. You, you love frogs? You're going to have a whole bunch of frogs, you know? And that's what God did. You love bugs? You're going to have a whole bunch of bugs. It's a judgment. It's going to happen. It's happened. Jesus, the Lord has done it before. Look, read the Old Testament. You'll see, and this is where people forget. The same God, the God that we worship, worship today, is the same, the same God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same God in the Old Testament. If he judged Egypt, the world, that was considered the world. He's going to judge this world. If he judged the time of Noah and the flood, he's going to do it again. God is not a liar. Let every man be a liar, but let God Almighty be true. Heaven and earth will pass. Jesus said, my word will never pass. And then we read 8. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. All these things are only the beginning of sorrow, birth pains. We are still living in the last days, saints. We are still seeing and feeling the birth pains, and they're coming more severe and closer and closer, and we're still waiting for the rapture of the church. All prophecies concerning the end times has been fulfilled leading up to the grip. The only thing we're waiting for is the rapture, and from there on, there are more prophecies. Everything's been fulfilled, everything. There is not one end-time prophecy concerning the last days from the day of Pentecost to the day of Christ's coming. There's no prophecy that has not been fulfilled. They all have been fulfilled. I want to leave you with this. Jesus gave us a commandment, right? The commission, right? In Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 to 20, he said, Go therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And here it is. Here's his promise. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Christ will be with us. He will be with us. Amen? Amen. Let us stand. I know many are quiet. I don't know if I became, you know, Reverend Nyquil or, but the scriptures in the end times is a serious thing. And we're, le- we're definitely getting close to the return of Christ. There is no time, and, and, and you, you've, you've heard it, you've probably seen it in your life, that people have been warned, warned, and warned, and even believers, warned, 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 and they do not take heed of the word of God. God is true. His word is true. And we are definitely getting close to that rapture. And so it's time for us to be right with God. It's time for us to not play church, not play Christian. It's time for us not to think about ourselves and building up our own empire, our own home, but to build a kingdom of help, to build a kingdom of God with Christ. There are people who are dying. There's chaos out there. And the only answer for, for all that's going on in this world, all the evil and all the lawlessness and all the hate is Jesus Christ. And we have the answer. And we're we're so quick to wanting 
a government and everybody to find the cure for all these diseases to solve the problem. But the ultimate answer, the antidote, the answer to the sins of this world and this loneliness is in us. We have it. We have it. We have it. And we need to share it with the world. Amen. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your promises. Lord, I pray, I pray that we do not fall asleep. I pray that we are busy about your business, not about ourselves, not about our lives. And what we plan for tomorrow, your word says, we don't know what lies for tomorrow. Lord willing, today we're just uh, alive. Tomorrow will be just a vapor. Lord, I just pray that we as your church would be your hands and feet in this world, this dying world. Lord, you're coming soon, and there are a lot of people that need to be saved. It is by your grace, Lord. So I pray, Lord, that we may honor you with our lives, glorify you with our bodies, glorify you with our tongues and our soul. Everything that we are, we give to you, Lord. Use us, Lord, in these last days. We ask, Lord. We love you, Lord. We thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, and all God's saints say, Amen. God bless you. May the Lord be with you. Have a blessed week.